All right, here we go. Good evening and welcome to Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. Today's topic is a very serious topic. It's called Suicide Awareness. And I have two distinguished guests. So I'm going to call them by the first names because I don't want to mess up their last names. We have Latoya, a licensed clinical social worker and one of the Mental Health Association in Delaware. We have Jennifer Ladies. Good evening and thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, we'll start off with Jennifer. If you could just discuss this uh, briefly, just introduce yourself, um, uh, what agency you work for, and, and what is your role, and then we'll go with Latoya. Sure. Um, as Omar mentioned, my name is Jennifer Smolowitz, and I am the Project Director for Suicide Prevention at the Mental Health Association, um, otherwise known as MHA. We are a statewide agency, and we are an affiliate of Mental Health America. Um, so if you hear the MHA thrown around, we are an affiliate of them. Um, we are a statewide agency that does education, advocacy, and support for various mental illnesses and suicide awareness. Um, and my role, mo my role with them is to oversee all of the suicide prevention efforts, trainings, um, the Delaware Suicide Prevention Coalitions, a lot of our conferences that we do that are suicide prevention related. All right, Latoya. Yes, my name is Latoya Congolo and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm the co-owner of Work Life Behavioral Health and Professional Training located in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Uh, we provide outpatient mental health services for um, anyone from ages four all the way up to ge the geriatric population. Um, we also partner with our local crisis team where we provide uh, suicide um, assessments and we also make referrals uh, to services. Um, and we also do a uh, contract for safety. All of a sudden they have an injury, injury that sidelines them. There's, that could be a huge risk. Um, so any financial loss, personality loss, job loss, relationship loss. So anything like that can definitely be a risk factor. Um, right. We can also start looking at some of the ACE factors, the adverse childhood experiences. Um, the higher somebody may rate on that scale, the more ACE factors they may have. There may be an inclination that they might be more at risk of suicide. Not always the case, but it does sometimes happen, especially if there's a lot of childhood trauma that they're trying to process. Um, a huge risk factor is if they have attempted in the past and also if they've recently lost somebody to suicide, um, a friend, a loved one, somebody that means a lot to them. A lot of times this could even be a celebrity or their favorite author, someone who they really look up to. Um, and also a huge risk factor as well, in addition to that, is if they have the access to the means. Um, if they have the access to means, there's that worry that that risk is imminent. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to intervene when any of those are in place. And okay. I could really go on and on. So I will get back to that if you need more. <laughs> okay, great, great. Uh, Latoya, I know uh, prior to uh, mm -hmm. us having this show, uh, when you and I were uh, Texting each other, you you had it. Omar, you got to talk about suicide screening. <laughs> so 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 you want to talk about uh, what is the suicide screening process for those who may not know who's watching. Well, so the suicide screening is um, really just a set of questions for us to determine uh, just how severe um, the suicidal thoughts are. Um, and uh, just as Jennifer mentioned, um, the means and the access um, to actually follow through with the um, ideations. So it can be as simple as asking questions such as, um, do you have a history of depression or mental illness? Um, because um, depression and other mental health disorders can intensify uh, those feelings of wanting to to uh, take, take your own life. Um, have you ever had thoughts of suicide, as Jennifer mentioned, is another key question. Um, do they have a plan? Have they created a plan um, for suicide? Um, are they taking any medications? Uh, some medications, um, if taken in large quantities, can um, cause fatalities. Um, often, often, if they're using drugs and alcohol, uh, substance use disorders uh, can also put someone at high risk for uh, suicide. So those are some of the screening questions. And depending on how many yeses they have, then that determines um, just how high of a risk they are. And it gives us clinicians an idea of what approach we need to take. Um, are they safe to go home? Do we need to put a safety plan in place? Or do we need to call 911 and have this person taken directly to um, the hospital for um, further psychiatric evaluation? You know, Jennifer, you mentioned something uh, that was crucial. You mentioned job loss. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned loss of a family member. Um, man, when this COVID thing mm -hmm. came out, I mean, my goodness, I mean, this this is taking people left and right. Um, and people are losing jobs. Um, people are losing their homes. Uh, so, so have any of you two uh, saw an increase in maybe uh, suicide attempts or, 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 or suicide deaths as, as a result of COVID-19? Right. 
Um, I can't speak to the specific data to it as our data always is about a year or two behind when we can actually do a full report. Um, but I do know that there has been a huge increase in the calls to a crisis lines. Um, and yeah. also with telehealth, there's also been um, more people reaching out for numbers. I know at our agency, we have an INR, an information and referral line. And I know that we've been receiving more calls of people trying to identify who they can go speak with or a place that they can go to receive help. So I know that while we haven't seen specific numbers that show that there has been an increase due to the COVID implications, I know that that number is coming. Um, I'm actually scared to see the data in a few years because right. I don't think it's going to look good, but um, right. we're just doing everything we can to support those so that we can try to keep those numbers as low as possible. Okay. So you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I would definitely add that um, I, I too don't have numbers, but I can say anecdotally in my uh, practice that um, I've seen an increase in um, stress related to work, um, financial difficulties, um, you know, relationship issues um, as a result of being cooped up in the house um, with your loved ones a little more than usual. Um, so these are some of the, the risk factors, but we're seeing it more commonly now with the pandemic. Um, you know, definitely financial and relationship problems are at the top of the list for many of the clients that I'm seeing. And I'm glad you mentioned, sorry to interrupt, I'm glad you mentioned the relationship problems because I know that we're seeing um, rates increase in the, among domestic violence cases and also with child abuse as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and even with child abuse, you know, that there are uh, statistically um, there are less reports being uh, made. However, it's because teachers don't have their eyes on kids. The police aren't involved. So there's not much community contact to where the people who would normally make those reports aren't aren't seeing the kids. So um, it, it is definitely a concern um, that a lot of kids are at home with no, um, you know, no adult outside of their family um, monitoring their their well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, Jennifer, you, you mentioned something about data, and, and I, as I was preparing for this show, uh, one of the things that popped in my, my head was um, on a local level here in Delaware and on a national level uh, across the United States of America, um, how prevalent is, is suicide? Yeah, so it's definitely... Um... Just the reported cases alone, um, and I, I say reported because in order for something to count in the data, it has to be a reported yeah, yeah, by the yeah. medical examiner. Um, so just on the reported data that we have, in Delaware, it was the 12th leading cause of death, and nationally, it tends to be the 10th to 11th leading cause, um, depending on the year. Um, mm -hmm. And just to compare the rates, Delaware specifically, and this data, again, is back to 2018, had a rate of 11.45 deaths per 100,000 people, whereas the national average was 14.2 per 100,000. So the rates are definitely higher. I think any rate higher than zero is too many, um, personally. So we're definitely seeing way too many people. In Delaware, we're losing mm -hmm. a person to suicide on an average of every three days or so. Wow. Way too many. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's definitely, that's, that, that definitely uh, a, a lot. Uh, I want to talk about uh, one, of the also, one of the thoughts that also popped in my head was men versus women. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Who, who commits suicide the most, uh, men or women, but, but also wanted to know in terms of uh, men and women who commit suicide, are, are, are they committing suicide because of the same reasons? Maybe you mentioned uh, relationships, uh, loss of job, uh, maybe loss of a home. Uh, so so, so, so are, are more women, when women commit suicide, is it the same reasons as men or is it two different reasons? If that question, hopefully that question makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it the possible, you know, you've been in an interview yeah, with all kinds of questions pop up in here. No, it, it makes sense. And um, what I'll say is, and I'll let Jennifer um, add to this, um, what we see is that women have a higher rate of attempting suicide. Mm -hmm. However, men are two to three times more likely to succeed at committing suicide. So um, the reasons, I'll, I'll say this too, the reasons do uh, matter based on gender and age. And when we get to talking about kids, you know, you're talking about bu bullying and, you know, social media and that, uh, you know, cyber bullying is um, more of a reason why kids attempt uh, suicide. So, I mean, gender differences, I'll let Jennifer uh, speak to that. Yeah, and to Latoya's point, Males do have a higher completion rate. Um, they do die by suicide more frequently because of the method that they use. So they're more likely to use more lethal means, whereas a female is more likely to use um, something that there's a better chance of intervening once an attempt has been made. 
I think the reasons why um, could be the same, but they could be different. A lot of times uh, women feel more comfortable talking to others about what's going on. They don't feel like they need to internalize a lot of things. Um, and while men are becoming more open, um, it might not be at that place yet um, for them. They might not feel comfortable going to support groups um, or talking openly with friends, whereas women tend to do that more frequently and feel it's more accepted socially to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We're also seeing, and you mentioned age, um, old elderly white males actually commit or die by suicide more frequently as well. They have one of the highest rates. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, we are seeing higher rates among males and it's typically the elderly that we're seeing the highest rate. Um, not that we're not seeing it across all the entire age span. Mm -hmm. And and what I would add too is that women are more likely to have more like the um, passive suicide or maybe more verbal cues like Jennifer mentioned like I just can't take it anymore my life is over I want to die you know just expressing it more verbally uh, than than a man would. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and I so think the society I'll pressures are changing too. I think it's becoming more accepted and more normal where it might not be the man who's the head of the household they may be staying home more where it might be um the woman going out and earning the money and doing all those things so i think as societal norms start changing we may see the rates starting to reflect that um, but that's inconclusive right now right getting more into the variables um uh, we mentioned gender we mentioned age but also i, I want i want to touch on culture Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, me being an African-American man, I, I really never really heard too much about suicide in, in, in the African-American community. Um, so both of you ladies, uh, how, how, how often or how prevalent is it um, that suicide exists in, in the African-American community? Yeah, it's it's um, scary for me because I'm seeing it more and more, especially in young children. I mean, we're talking elementary age kids and um, even, you know, nationally, the numbers are on the rise for black children ages five to 11, where they're showing that more kids um, are attempting suicide and the more more of them are black. Um, oftentimes it's, um, you know, kids express having a lack of support at home or not having someone to openly um, discuss their feelings with. Um, you know, it's that whole stigma around, you know, mental health or not feeling normal or feeling like I'm going crazy and they don't want people to perceive them as crazy. So it's, it's really about them not being able to um, express those feelings openly and internalizing a lot of those feelings. Mm -hmm. So, so it's so it's just a follow up. Do, do, do you think that at the dinner table, well, I guess a lot of us really don't eat at the dinner table anymore. Hey, why eat in a separate room? But in, in home discussions and family discussions, uh, do, do you think that we uh, African Americans even talk about suicide? You know what? I think that there are a lot of things that we probably are starting to talk about more than we had in the past. Um, I, I, I definitely encourage family members and I, I usually tell family members, it's okay to ask your loved ones on a scale of one to 10, are you having any thoughts of suicide? It's okay to ask those questions and to ask it in a non-judgmental, compassionate way. But um, I, I would encourage anyone, you know, because we all are dealing with stressors and, and life, you know, when we got to meet life on life's terms, it's not uncommon for us to feel depressed or anxiety or maybe even have thoughts of, you know, if I weren't here, then maybe things would be a little bit easier for everybody. But we got to make it um, a norm to be to to be comfortable having those conversations. Okay, and, and Jennifer, you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I think there's definitely um, some shifts happening among various cultures and even various faiths and religions. Um, I know that we have people in our trainings all the time who will say, "My church doesn't talk about this," or. Um, I did a presentation at a mosque one time and it was the first time that they invited somebody in to really have this open conversation with them. And it was, it was so nice to see that people are becoming more accepting of talking openly about mental illness and suicide and just not normalizing it to the fact that it, um, it's something that we're going to talk about every day, but being okay having those conversations. So I think to Latoya's point, those shifts are starting to happen. Those conversations are starting to happen more. Um, we're encouraging people to reach out. So if we're encouraging people to reach out, we also have to have the resources available for them to reach out to and the education available. How do I know if somebody's going through something and what do I do? Do I, maybe I don't have to call the police or maybe I don't have to call 
um, a crisis. Maybe I can just call somebody else and get them connected with a teacher or their parent or whoever that might be. Right. I want to stay with Jennifer and then Latoya, you could add in with Latoya. You, you touched on this a little bit, but I want to talk about warning signs. Okay. I mean, we're all in the field, so 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 we, we may be able to identify some warning signs, but for, but for a family member or a friend or a colleague who may not be into the social service arena, human service, social work arena, whatever you want to call it. Um, educate them who are watching in terms of what are some of the warning signs that may indicate that a friend of theirs or a loved one of theirs, family member of theirs, of their, uh, have warning signs that they may be contemplating about suicide. Sure. Um, there's definitely a ton. I think we'll start by going over some of the feelings that a person may express or show. Okay, they may talk openly about feelings of hopelessness, feeling worthless, um, guilt, shame, helplessness. Um, you may hear them say that they feel like they're kind of drowning. They don't see their way out. There's a black hole they can't see their way out of. Um, quicksand, however you want to explain that. Um, feelings of they're not good enough. They don't want to be a burden to you. Um, again, they might feel like they're worthless or not able to live up to the standards that they set for themselves or other people may have placed on them. And I mentioned earlier with that loss of identity, this could be, again, um, maybe they made a mistake and everything that they've worked so hard for is starting to be taken away from them because of some of their actions or um, losses in relationship can be huge. So if you see that somebody's going through a major life change, taking the time to ask them, how do you feel about that? because somebody might feel okay with it and be able to move on to the next thing. But for somebody else, it could be a major crisis and a major change and shift in the way that they do their day to day. Um, if you hear somebody mm -hmm. talking openly about giving away their possessions, if they're making statements like they don't wanna be here anymore, soon you won't have to worry about me. You always wanna make sure you're asking clarifying questions. What do you mean by that? Tell me more about that. Um, any major changes in their personality. So it's not just worrying about those who go from happy to sad, but also those who go from sad to happy. And this is a point we always like to put out there because sometimes a person may show signs of improvement right before a suicide attempt because they've come to terms with their decision. So yes, we wanna worry about our friends who go from happy to sad, but going from sad to happy might be a huge red flag as well. Um, changes in their behavior. If they're typically pretty passive and all of a sudden they're more aggressive, um, they're starting fights, they're getting into trouble at school or at work um, with the law, whoever that might be. Um, and really just anything that, if they're not acting the way you typically know them to be, you want to ask those follow-up questions. If somebody, if something's giving you that bad goosebump feeling, take the time to say, let's talk, what's going on, I'm here for you because we never want the one time we say, oh, I'll catch up with them tomorrow, or they must just be having a bad day. We don't want them to feel alone in that moment. So if you see something, say something. I know that's a phrase that's used for a variety of different things, but if something's making you feel like something's not right, taking the time to stop what you're doing and follow up in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Jennifer touched on a lot of the behavioral cues, the emotional cues. Um, you know, 70% of people <clears throat> who have, um, you know, thoughts of suicide, they usually give someone a warning, whether it be a family member or a friend. And it's really important for family members and friends not to sweep it under the carpet. Um, you know, we have to be assertive and speaking up and expressing our concerns for people and, uh, you know, and persuading them to get the help that they need. Um, um, but when we talk about behavioral cues, um, you know, uh, Jennifer had mentioned um, someone who's, um, I guess, um, giving away their prized possessions, um, you know, getting their affairs in order, you know, now they're, you know, they have a will established or, you know, they're, they're taking out life insurance policies. Um, they're socially withdrawing, just seeing changes in their mood and their behavior. Um, but I want to share a story um, of a, um, a client that I had worked with very early on in my career, in my early 20s, um, just out of undergrad. Um, you know, this client had been in and out of um, the psychiatric hospital for suicidal ideations for years, had a very um, lengthy history. Um, so, you know, he was, he was in outpatient treatment, you know, we're doing community support services with him. And, um, I had gone to his house for a home visit and he had, um, uh, I had just commented on how beautiful I thought his aquarium was in the living room. And he said, oh, you know what, if you want it, it's yours. You know, he offered me his aquarium and I'm like, no, I can't do that, you know, because it's unethical, right? Um, so um, we hadn't heard from him in a couple of days and, you know, um, we had contacted his emergency contact. Um, his loved one went to his house and found him. He had hung himself. 
And I had beat myself up for the, for that for so long because I saw that he was a little more elated. He was, you know, offered me his aquarium. I had saw the change in his mood. He just seemed a little happier than usual. Um, but it was it was um, a learning experience for me that you you can't keep quiet when you see signs. It's important, and we all have a duty to speak up um, because we feel the grief when we lose a loved one or, or a client even um, because we didn't um, you know pick up on the signs and, and act on them. Right. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead. And I think to that point too of. A lot of times people might say like, oh, well, it's not my business to see what's going on with them. I don't want to get in their business. Suicide is everybody's business. I'm not saying that you need to go gossip to your neighbors or anything like that, but this is the time where you can butt in and say, I, I need to know what's going on. I need, if you don't want to talk to me, you have to talk to somebody. I'll connect you with somebody. So this is a time to put aside our social norms of it. You want to keep to yourselves and say, this is when we really need to come together and say, something's not right. Let's get you the help that you need. Right. Uh, let, let me give you, let me give you a scenario. John Doe tells Jason Doe um, that he's, he's he's depressed. His girlfriend left him, and he tells Jason Doe that I'm thinking about suicide. Jason's response is, "What well, man? You crazy? You want depressed? You want to get over it, girl? Then get over it, man. Just just, just get over it. Things happen. Life happens." Kill yourself over what? For who? For what? There's thousands of women out there. Come on, man. You're, you're overreacting. And sometimes that, that may be the response that, that one may receive that, that people don't fully understand. Um, so if you two want to comment on mm -hmm. the significance of, of, of not downplaying someone's feelings or, or emotions because you, people take things in differently. I know he may have been in love with that, that woman. You know, she may have cheated on him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's heartbroken. She was his main support system, his only support system. Sometimes people from the outside, they, they, they may not fully understand. And Omar, that scenario that you gave is more common than not. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that is a typical reaction that most people get when they do share that they're having thoughts of suicide. Oh, man, get over it. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but minimizing it, again, it reinforces that stigma. It reinforces that shame and that embarrassment that you have just for having those sort of thoughts. But a more appropriate response would be to ask more questions. So when, you know, Jason, I think his name was, you said Jason and Jill do. Uh, yeah, so, you know, when Jason said, you know what, man, I, I feel like I'm just going to end it all. I can't take it anymore. Then, you know, Joe or John would say, well, how do you plan to do that? You know, what is, what are you planning to do just to get more information, just to gauge just how serious it is. But even if they don't get all of the information, just that person saying it alone is a red flag. That's enough to act. And that's enough for that person to reach out to the family members or even call 911 or the local crisis unit to get that person help. Right. Um, yeah, and I think to that I'm point sorry. too, of making sure that, um, Again, we're taking every threat seriously. And I think Latoya, you mentioned this earlier, withholding any judgment when you're talking with somebody who might be at risk of suicide because them saying to that person, oh, well, you wouldn't do something stupid or crazy or anything like that. If the person's already feeling down, that's only gonna make them feel worse nine times out of 10. So we wanna make sure that we're withholding as much judgment as possible, um, letting them feel supported and cared for um, and letting them express the feelings that they're having, because sometimes putting it out there into words, it might be the first time that they're actually vocalizing what they're attempt thinking of attempting to do. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Jennifer, um, uh, through, through your work with the Mental Health Association, and Troy, you can chime in as well. Um, uh, how do one commit suicide? I mean, is it more prevalent in certain cases where you see someone uh, commit suicide with self-inflicted gunshot or are they hanging themselves or are they overdosing on, on, on pills? Is, is one one attempt more, more um, prevalent than others? Um, based on, I actually looked at some data today to be as current as possible. Um, the lethal means, so firearms, um, typically on average are about 50% of all suicides. That number goes up and down depending on the year as well. But it's usually right above 50% um, are account for all suicides. Um, 
and we try, I want to point out too, we want to try, we try as hard as possible to kind of sometimes pull away from what that method was and what those means were, um, okay. not focusing on how they did it, but sometimes focusing on why they did it. Because if we can figure right, out right. why, maybe we can help somebody else who may be going mm -hmm. through something similar. Yeah, so, so Jennifer mentioned it, um, you know, number one is um, handguns, you know, not assault rifles, but handguns. Um, I, I want to also mention too, Omar, we haven't touched on this and I, and I cannot think of the term off the top of my head, but there's a form of suicide that's more indirect or more passive that um, you usually see in the black community. So it can be suicide by cop, you know, provoking a situation with the cop to where you intentionally get shot or, you know, a rival in your um, neighborhood that, you know, is more likely going to retaliate. Um, it can be by not taking care of your health, taking your diabetes medication or just some sort of, um, you know, self-destructive behavior where your health deteriorates and you're intentionally um, inflicting that, um, that, that, that onto yourself. So when we think about suicide in the black community, we got to think about that it's not always by firearm. It's not always by taking a, a, a large amount of prescription medications. It's really about, um, you know, putting ourselves in a risky situation where someone else will take our life or where a health issue can deteriorate to the point where we uh, where we meet our demise. Right. That's, that's, that's a great point. Um, we mentioned our psychiatric centers um, <clears throat> earlier. So for those who are watching right now, for the educational informative, information, information, um, education and information, uh, I wanna, uh, if you can elaborate on once a person, let's say a person has a suicide thoughts and, and they get admitted to a psychiatric center, um, what, what kind of treatment takes place while they're in the hospital? So um, usually it starts with a psychiatric evaluation. So, um, you know, they're given a comprehensive assessment um, to determine their risk level. Um, you know, if they're deemed high risk, then they usually, here in Maryland, I'll say, and this is probably standard across the nation, is that they're usually um, admitted to the hospital um, for 72 hours minimum, um, where they're being monitored, um, supervised 24 seven, um, you know, given medications. Um, and then as they're in the hospital, if they are um, manageable and stable within 72 hours, then um, there's a plan of care that's put into place um, to make sure that they have services um, once they're discharged. But it's not uncommon for people if, you know, their, um, their uh, thoughts and they're um, psychiatrically unstable, um, that, that they uh, transfer to a more of a longer term facility. Um, here in Maryland, it, um, people often um, are transferred to Shepherd Pratt, um, where they're there at least a minimum of two weeks, um, you know, for ongoing evaluation. Right. Okay. So, 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 I mean, are, are, are they getting uh, individual therapy or are they getting group uh, uh, therapy or mm -hmm. are they using the medications? All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. And I know in Delaware, um, I can't speak to other states, but I know in Delaware, just because our agency um, does them, we have somebody on our team who goes into each of the behavioral health hospitals and does monthly mental health presentations. So they're not only hearing from the staff there, they're also hearing mm -hmm. from quote unquote outsiders who are going in and just letting them know what resources are out there. And just, it's another way of showing that the community is there to support you. Um, I do just wanna say too, that just know what the policy might be because a lot of times people may go to one of the behavioral health hospitals and they just think, oh, I just want an evaluation and then I'll be able to walk right out. That's not always the case. Um, so just mm -hmm. doing as much research as possible um, just so you know, even when you go to, if you start going to talk to a therapist or whatever place you're going to, or whoever you're speaking with, just do your research and know what the policies and procedures are. Um, it will just help all around. Mm -hmm. You know, as we're speaking, um, I know uh, Jennifer mentioned the word why, why they commit suicide. And one of the whys, the, the, the whys that I ask myself more, more so than often is when a person is murdered suicide, when, 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 they, when they shoot and kill, Two or three people, and then they end up uh, killing, them, killing themselves. I mean, that's just something that really drew on top of my head. I don't know if you two ladies have the answer to it, or if you want to want to address it. But I mean, that was a question that I've always always asked myself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's a great question for the police. I mean, yeah. I, they're the, usually the first on the scene. So, mm -hmm. you know, they usually have uh, more of a background um, because when that happens, I, I, you know, I haven't had any clients personally who've, you know, gone through therapy and, and you know, uh, had a, a, a murder suicide um, event following treatment. So, you know, I really, I really can't speak to that, but that sounds like a great question for the police. Maybe Jennifer can chime in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would think with the amount of crime show documentaries I watch, I would have an answer for you, but unfortunately no, I don't. don't. Um, I, it, I mean, every type of situation like that makes me sad and I, I don't know if we'll ever understand it. Um, mm. If there's someone out there who can study the mind that would be able to look more into that, um, I don't know what the implications are, why somebody mm -hmm. chooses that road um, as opposed to just taking their own life. Not that we want that to happen either, but yeah, it's a tough one. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. have an answer to that one. Right, right. You know, both of you ladies touched on this earlier, which I want to elaborate a little bit more on, and, and that is teen suicide. I mean, children and teenagers are the most precious people in the world. We, 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 spoil them. we, we, we take them to get ice cream. We, we, we take them to the carnival of mm -hmm. <laughs> Disney World. Um, now, I mean, at 13, 14, and 15, uh, well, you, you're contemplating committing suicide. Mm -hmm. the, thought, the thought process of, of what, what makes a teen at that's a, such a young mm -hmm. age uh, think about suicide uh, so so i mean how often do, do we see uh teen suicide i guess in maryland and in here in delaware uh we start with jennifer de sure. definitely too often um i think there's a lot of reasons that go into that um i did also again to pull up just some quoting accurate data um there's a youth risk youth youth excuse me youth risk behavior survey that's done every year nationally um and in the 2019 year over 18 percent of high school students Students mentioned that in the previous year they contemplated attempting suicide. So they had those thoughts. And that's a lot of people when we break it down. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes a little bit further that close to 9% actually went ahead and attempted. And that's not counting for those who did die by suicide. So I think it's something that's happening that we're not talking about. We're not talking about it early enough in schools. Too many places are shying away from it or saying, oh, that's a conversation they need to have at home. But maybe the parents aren't having those conversations with them. Um, it's just way too many people we are seeing a decrease in the amount of empathy that children are having for one another and an increase in the suicide rates. So when there's mm -hmm. somebody who's having a fight, instead of going to get help and being a good bystander, we're seeing and doing that bystander intervention, everybody's pulling out their phones and making sure that the video goes viral um, yeah. or they're adding to it. They're being the person's hype man when that's not necessarily what they need. They need you to go get help. Um, it goes back to two, I think, um, we're seeing more and more bullying um, with social media. So what's ha happening in school is following you home. People mm -hmm. are being bullied from people that they don't know. Sometimes they're people in 10 states away who they've never met before, but they're commenting on a picture. And there's just a lot of pressures. Mm -hmm. People are putting up their highlight reels on, online and you're seeing kids say like, oh, I want that to be my life, but they're not seeing the bigger picture. They're not seeing that what the person's not posting. Um, so yeah, we are seeing kids, even as young as five years old, talk openly about suicide and they don't know the finality of it. Um, I once had a parent mention this to me, and this is some, a story that will stay with me forever, that their child said to them, but in my video games, when I die, I can start over. So they don't realize that this is final. This isn't something mm -hmm. that you can just take the video game out and blow on it and put it back in and move on with their day. So their brains aren't fully developed to understand the finality of it. And I think there's sometimes those rash decisions as well. You mentioned earlier, Omar, about um, in that John Doe story about saying, oh, they broke up with somebody. Um, sometimes for kids, they could go through a breakup at 13 years old and it could be the worst day of their life. So as parents and guardians and anybody who's working with kids, it might not be the biggest deal to you, but it could be the biggest deal to them. So trying not to mm -hmm. minimize their feelings and their emotions and knowing that, yeah, this might be like, okay, you're going to have so many others. What's the big deal to this? Mm -hmm. Then this could be the worst thing that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and it's not like our day where we could transfer schools and reinvent ourselves and kind of leave the bullies and all the drama behind us. You know, the drama is following the kids. And, you know, the more time they spend on social media, you know, the more they're being attacked and they're trying to, you know, um, mitigate the issue, but it's snowballing and it gets out of control. Um, you know, the, the bullying, it's not the cause for suicide, but it's certainly a contributing factor. 
um, you know, when, when kids are being bullied, they're at higher risk for having suicidal thoughts and behaviors. They're at higher risk for experiencing depression, um, low self-esteem. Um, and then uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier about the brain development. They don't have that executive function and they don't have kind of like the cause and effect thinking. You know, they're more impulsive. Um, as teenagers. And it's not even, we, it starts even earlier than the teen years, Omar. You mentioned 13 or 14. You know, mm -hmm. we're seeing it in five, six, eight year olds, you know, mm -hmm. elementary age kids who are having thoughts of suicide. Um, but it's important for family members, you know, just like Jennifer said, to not minimize it. You know, if it's their drama, the end of their, you know, I have a teenager, you know, her drama is my drama. Oh my God, are you serious? You know, I get into it with her because I feel like I need to be present and need to show her that, you know, her feelings matter. And even if I don't understand, I can at least show empathy. Um, but just monitoring our kids' thoughts and feelings, talking to them, you know, monitoring their social media even, um, you know, because that, that's where a lot of the, the bullying is taking place, unfortunately. And I think too, it's also important to realize how much is changing that, it's very rare now that there is a parent who's home. Um, a lot of times parents are working multiple jobs just because the cost of living has gone up so much. And right. it's not the same as it was when we were all younger. And it, things are just different. So less family dinners right. are happening. A lot of conversations are happening as you're picking up your kids, bringing them from one place and dropping them off somewhere else, or they're being raised by other family members or neighbors or whoever it might be so there's mm -hmm. so many other factors that play into this so it's not just a mental suicide isn't just a mental health concern there's so many factors that we need to look at mm -hmm. that if we got other things correct done correctly maybe there would be some lower suicide rates because i of that. agree absolutely i agree oh, i want to talk about uh professionals in the field um jennifer at the mental health association delaware uh you you guys have a um a training uh, suicide training. Uh, you you want to talk about mm -hmm. that? Sure. So we actually offer a variety of trainings everywhere from an hour to two full days. Um, we have a general, two ge more general trainings. We have a lifelines one and a QPR, which is question, uh, pursue and respond. And those trainings just go over a little bit of the background information, some of the warning signs to look out for, um, some of the statistics mm -hmm. and really how you can help. We also have a um, suicide alertness for everyone. Or, yes, um, Safe Talk Training, which is a three-hour course that takes it a little bit further. It starts at intervention with them. Um, and our most inclusive training is our Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. Um, ASSIST is what it's usually called. And that's where we really go through an intervention with someone who's currently at risk of suicide. Um, we make sure to stress in all of our interventions that these are, in all of our trainings, that these are verbal interventions. We always want you as a person caring for someone else to keep your own safety in mind. Um, we will never ask an individual to put on a cape and go save the world. Just do what you can to be more aware of the situations around you, but also knowing your limits, knowing that if you're having a bad day, you might not be the best caregiver for somebody. Or if you're feeling overwhelmed or bogged down with something, seeing if there's somebody else. We can't just let the problem go completely, but we need to make sure that we're getting other people involved when needed. Right, now, now your trainings, are, are they, uh, I guess, are they currently online or virtual? Some of them are done virtually. And then as soon as we get the clear, we can start doing some more in person. Um, I will say it's hard to do suicide prevention online just because there's okay. so much built into our trainings that builds on the right. connection and the open conversation. So we're definitely missing that in-person piece to it, um, but we're trying to do as much as we can to keep the community informed about what's going on. Okay, and just another follow-up question with that. Uh, is there a specific training for, for family members? And I mean, we talked a great deal of family members of being able to identify warning signs and such. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you uh, do trainings for family members in particular? Yeah, so our trainings are open to everyone. Um, we've had actually a grandmother one time took the training um, because she was raising her grandchild and she didn't know what to do. She said it was so different from when she was parenting the first time that right. she needed kind of that refresher course of what to look out for. Um, so yeah, our trainings are open to anybody. We have a youth training that we do, but our trainings that I mentioned are usually 18 and older. Um, but I know there's other organizations who, in the support groups that they offer, they offer education classes specifically towards family members. Um, I know NAMI, for example, offers a support group for, and an educational program for family members who are living with someone with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, I want to talk about post-treatment. Um, 
after a failed suicide attempt. Uh, there, mm -hmm. there, there are a great number of people who, who attempted suicide but mm -hmm. failed, which was a great thing. But uh, I think they need that ongoing counseling and, and therapy because you never know, they, they may try it again. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're still going through some stressors, they're going through depression, uh, stress, whatever have you. Um, so if you could talk about those who may be watching uh, about the significance of continuing ongoing treatment. Yeah, and, and the ongoing treatment is necessary. It, it, it has to be a part of the plan of care. Um, so if someone uh, discharges from the hospital, um, they should follow up with an outpatient mental health specialist, um, even a psychiatrist uh, for medication management. Um, but for the therapy side, um, what we do is we help manage, help people manage their symptoms. So the symptoms of the depression, you know, what triggered the suicidal thoughts, um, getting their family involved, you know, the developing, you know, um, you know, a suicide safety plan um, with family members so they can recognize what a person looks like when they're well, what are the risk factors, what they need to do to keep the person safe in the home, um, and also support, support groups are key as well, just helping them get the support of other peers um, so they don't feel alone in this, um, have people that um, they can relate to. Um, you know, in regards to how they're feeling, but also how to manage those feelings and learning coping skills from uh, through their peers. And, and I'm so glad that, that, that you mentioned um, uh, peer, group, peer support groups and peers because there are those who unfortunately may not have that family uh, mm -hmm. contact for one reason or another, and they, they do feel alone. So, I mean, it's very significant that they do find a support system uh, in regards to support groups and, and as long as, as, as peers as well. Um, I want to talk about, you mentioned a teenage uh, suicide. Um, wow. Uh, with the Mental Health Association, do you guys, or are you affiliated with, with someone who, who goes into the schools mm -hmm. to the council, their fellow students? Because it, it, it has a strong effect on them, especially if they were good friends with, with the student. I, mean, I don't know if that's something that the Mental Health Association does. Uh, Latoya, I don't know if that's something that, 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 that you do, or, or you know someone that, that does that in the state of Maryland? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll go into the schools and kind of work with select groups of students. Um, those are the students who have been um, kind of selected by the administration of either people who would make good allies in the program, people who may um, be open about some of the mental health struggles that they're having and they're just looking for ways to connect these students in a safe environment. Um, but we'll also go into do some of the into the, some of the health classes and do um, one of our lifelines trainings to give the students the knowledge that they might not be getting elsewhere. Um, making sure that there's always the teachers in the room with us and the counselors in the room with us because we know that when we leave there's somebody there who was able to witness some of the emotions that may have been happening um, yeah. and can do more follow ups with the students because that follow up is so important. Um, also knowing that we do small group settings in schools that rather than school assemblies, because we want to make sure that if we see somebody becoming emotional over what we're saying, that we're able to make that connection with them to get them the help that they need. Um, but to your mm -hmm. point, I know there's a lot of schools who are starting their own mental health clubs where they can work one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with the students. Um, so really, if there's a school or if those of you watching are connected with a school, just making sure there's really good advisors for these types of clubs, advisors that are going to put in that extra effort to stay after and talk to these students when needed and really be an advocate for them because they may not be getting that support at home and they may only be getting it in a school setting. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I was gonna uh, say the same thing is that uh, we all need to be advocates um, in, you know, in, in encouraging schools and practically basically demanding schools um, you know, address mental health uh, with the children. Um, I know that the health curriculum here in, uh, in the middle schools, um, they do build in, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, certain disorders, um, suicide prevention. Um, our local crisis team here is very robust. They're very connected with our schools. So um, they often go into the schools. Um, they've done uh, several programs with students. So it really is a community effort. You know, it's going to have to take families involved, uh, specialists out in the community, educators, um, to see the importance of, of um, you know, addressing suicide with our students. Yeah, and we, we try to do parent programming too. Um, we don't always have the turnout that we would hope for. But again, that kind of goes back to that. There's so many other things going on that until it's affecting them personally, they don't always realize that. And that's all of us. Until something impacts us personally, we don't always realize how important it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, we talked about the schools, but I also want to get into uh, 
employers, because mm -hmm. so I listened to your story earlier, you mentioned how the client that you, that you comment on his uh, fish tank aquarium and how he later committed suicide. Now that could be a strong lasting effect, you know, for, for the case manager, the, the social worker. So if you two can talk about the significance of employers having a counseling program for the employees who, who work with the clients, because, you know, you build, you build that therapeutic relationship. You, you see them on a weekly basis for their meds. You may take them shopping. You do uh, supportive therapy, individual mm -hmm. therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. And then all of a sudden they commit suicide or, or better yet, where I work at, it was like, well, one occasion, I, I think one of the workers had found um, a client that committed mm. suicide. So he had to leave work early because it was so devastating. So uh, that worker, that employee, you know, they, they need support. Yeah, I mean, that's that's that could be traumatic, you know, for a person. It could be. Um, and absolutely, you know, we we are on the front lines. You know, we're seeing people at their most vulnerable, their most critical, and absolutely we, we can reach our breaking point. It, it's emotionally overwhelming for us, and um, employers need to recognize that. Um, and if they don't, you know, we need to recognize it within ourselves and seek help. You know, I, I know for me personally, I have a therapist. I do monthly supervision with the group of social workers. You know, so we need that support. And if our employers don't, um, you know, encourage it or offer it, we have to seek it for ourselves because this, this work, you, you can only handle but so much and, and we need to be honest with ourselves. And I think too, to that point, the more we can destigmatize mental health and suicide, the more we can change the language um, and just encourage people to be more open about it. If somebody can go to their employer and feel comfortable that they can say, this is something that's going on right now. I might be a little late in meeting some of my deadlines. It could alleviate some of that stress and um, anxiety feelings that that person might be having. So the more openness we can build where you feel that you can talk to your employer without fearing that you're going to lose your job or have things taken away from you. That's so important. And I mentioned the language too, because, and I still kind of slip up from time to time, even moving away from using the term committed and moving to died by suicide, because we often um, associate committed with crime or sins or something with a negative connotation. Right. So the more we can mm -hmm. have these open conversation and bring these points to the mm -hmm. forefront um, can help change how people feel comfortable talking about it and can really shift mm -hmm. suicide awareness overall. Mm -hmm. You know, this field there that we work in, it can be emotionally draining, uh, mm -hmm. physically draining, but it also can be very rewarding. Uh, mm -hmm. Both of you ladies have worked in your jobs for, for quite some time. I want to start off with Jennifer Den Latoya. Um, let's talk about uh, the reason why you continue to, to work in this field. Um, what is the reward for you and uh, what do you get out of it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely something that being on sometimes the back end of things, so doing the education programs, we don't do direct services. So I don't see the um, immediate implications of the work that I do, but just mm -hmm. knowing that I'll get um, emails from people or phone calls saying, oh, I used something you taught me in a training and I was really able to connect with my daughter or my sister or friend or whoever that might be. So I think um, something that keeps me with it is just knowing that how important it is when you are able to make that connection with someone, we'll occasionally will get a crisis call. And um, there is a story that will stick with me forever of somebody that I was able to connect with and prevent her from following through on a suicidal thought that she was having. Um, so just being able to know that those days are out there and that even on the days where um, I don't feel like I can give it a hundred percent, just knowing that the next day is going to get better. And it's, I don't know, it's hard because I don't, like I said, I don't see the direct implications of the work that I do, but knowing right. that I'm doing work that's hopefully making this a safer world all around. Right. <laughs> you know what? I've had a fire in my belly for mental health and treatment since, oh my God, since uh, as, as long as I can remember. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a passion. It's like second nature. It's something I believe in. I believe that we all need mental health. If our head is sick, our body gets sick. I mean, I, I don't see how, you know, most of us can function in life without some mental health treatment at some point in our lives. So for me, you know, I, I believe strongly in it. I think that it's important for all of us. I've seen individuals heal. I've seen families heal as a result of the individual healing. I've seen communities heal as a result of families and individual healing. 
So I feel like it's important to our society. It's important to all of us as individuals. And if we believe that and continue to push for it and advocate for it, I see, I, I believe that we'll see positive changes in our society overall. Right. What we're seeing right now is anger, is fear, mm -hmm. depression. It's an emotional response. And when people don't get the help that they need, they react irrationally out of emotions. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna give you ladies the opportunity for, for closing comments um, as we end the program. Yeah. <clears throat> you can give the information of your respective agencies, um, the hours of operations, of the phone numbers, the, the website, and if you have any upcoming uh, programs, whoever want to go first, just go ahead and do it. <laughs> Uh, sure. Oh, go ahead, Latoya. Uh, sure. So um, uh, the name of my uh, agency is Work Life Behavioral Health and Professional Training, and we're located at uh, 7310 Ritchie Highway, Suite 307 in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Um, our phone number is 410-487-6052. Uh, you can like our Facebook page, which is Work Life Behavioral Health. Um, you can also uh, take a look at our website, which is uh, worklifebhllc.com. Um, we also do trainings. Um, we are a NADAC approved uh, CU provider. Um, so we have a training tomorrow on ethics. Um, we also have a family peer curriculum um, that teaches families uh, ways to be able to provide family to family peer support to help family members um, recover from uh, mental health and uh, substance use disorders as well. Now, Latoya, now is that training, is it for anyone who's interested or is it for specific individuals? Well, no, it's, um, it's, it's for anyone who's interested. Um, we do offer CUs for people who are seeking a uh, family peer uh, endorsement, um, but we offer CUs if you're a licensed social worker, um, drug and alcohol counselor, professional counselor. Um, so it is national. So our CUs are recognized, you know, nationally through NADAC. Okay, what's the website, uh, phone number once again for people who are interested? Yeah, so yeah, so the website is uh, worklifebhllc.com. If you go on our uh, Facebook page, Work Life Behavioral Health and Professional Training, if you like the page, you'll see um, uh, events posted, uh, training information posted as well. Okay, Jennifer. Sure. So um, MHA is a statewide agency, so we cover all of Delaware, um, but we are based out of Wilmington. So our office is in the Community Service Building, which is in downtown Wilmington across from Hotel DuPont. We are Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Um, our, our phone number is 302-654-6833. And if you visit our website, which is M-H-A-I-N-D. E org. So it stands for the Mental Health Association in Delaware. Um, there's access there to find out when upcoming trainings are happening, um, to learn more about our organization, um, just to get mo more familiar with who we are and the services that we offer. Um, but we always have online um, training opportunities coming up, both suicide prevention, general mental health, and also with our peer program as well. So all of the information can be found at our website. All right, ladies, I'd like to thank you both for being my guest this uh, evening. You were an awesome guest and you provided a lot of, lot of information. It was awesome. So thank you once again. And uh, thank, thank you, you, the audience, for watching. So uh, like, subscribe, and share. Okay, ladies, uh, if I do future shows in mental health, I'm going to give you a ring. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank <laughs> you. Or, or, or email. <laughs> All right, thanks again, ladies. All right, thank Bye, you, Omar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.